You can be seated. yesterday and some of the time we started back to this morning. If anyone tried to engage you in any conversation about this case outside the, the jury, uh, outside the jury room, please raise your hand. No hands are being raised. If anyone got any kind of information to you from any source whatever that purports to be about this case, please raise your right hand. Please raise your hand. No one is raising your hand. All right. Just want to make sure the gentleman you can proceed. <coughs> Solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please have a seat. Give us your name, please, ma'am. Spell your last name. Linda Littlejohn, L I T T L E J O H N. Who do you work for? Uh, I am retired from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Laboratory in Nashville, Tennessee. How long did you work for the TBI Crime Lab? Uh, just a little less than 30 years. And what were your duties with the TBI Crime Lab? I was a special agent forensic scientist assigned to the microanalysis unit. Can you give us a little bit about your educational background and training in your particular field? Yes, sir. Uh, I, have a bachelor, I have a bachelor's degree and major in chemistry from the University of Tennessee at Martin. Upon employment with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation in October of 1988, I correctly completed a two-year training program in the areas of physical comparisons, fiber comparison, and shoe print comparison. During that two-year training program, I read various articles and books, I gave talks and presentations, and I learned how to process this type of evidence under the direct supervision of other court qualified forensic scientists. I was given mock cases and eventually had mock uh, trials on these cases uh, in these areas and um, I completed all of that correctly. I have attended several classes in international symposiums at the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, Training Academy in Quantico, Virginia. I was also a member of three professional forensic scientist organizations. In what specific areas uh, did you perform testing? In this case? What, what, in three out of three. Uh, those three areas, mainly also some explosives cases, but um, it was microanalysis, uh, fiber comparisons, physical comparisons, and sheet print comparisons. Uh, we'd move uh, agent, or retired agent Lou John in as a expert in forensic microanalysis. No objection. The court will recognize uh, retired agent when the Little John is an expert in the field. And as, as part of that, have you testified on <coughs> many or few occasions? Yes, I have. Across the state of Tennessee? I have. Uh, federal court? Once in federal court, yes. Now, as it relates to this case, what were you asked to do? I was asked to look at various pieces of um, floral fabric and do a physical comparison on those. And a what A physical comparison. For the, for to determine what, if able to? Uh, to see if any of those pieces could be fracture matched together to see if they had been uh, whole at one time. Yeah, you mentioned the term fracture match. Tell the jury what that means. Well, let me back up a little bit. There's two basically, two types of physical comparisons. There's a physical comparison where you look at like items and you look at the physical characteristics like uh, size or shape or pattern or color or texture and you're able to look at those things and see if those are consistent. And so you're able to say that they could have had a common origin. And then there's a, a physical comparison that's a fracture match where something that has been cut or torn or broken into one or more pieces, you're able to align those pieces along the fracture line to look at the matching individual characteristics across, across that fracture line to say that those items at one time had been one piece. And is that what you did with certain uh, items of yes. fabric in this case? 
Uh, specifically, I'll ask you if you received uh, a, some fabric from the Shannon Christian autopsy to examine. I did. Would that, would that be your lab number, or lab uh, item 15C? Yes, sir. And also some fabric from the Chris Newsom autopsy? Yes, sir. In lab item 74A? That's correct. correct. And also some floral fabric from a garbage bag in the kitchen, um, uh, lab item 85A? Yes, sir. And also, or lastly, floral fabric from railroad tracks, item 85B? Yes, sir. Now tell us about your examination of those items and what, what conclusions you reached. I first examined each uh, exhibit individually and wrote up notes to what was in each one of those. Um, once I saw that there was some floral fabric that, that matched in the type of pattern and the color, uh, I tried to align those up to see if I could make some fracture matches. Um, there were several pieces that I was able to make a fracture match with between the uh, Christian autopsy and the uh, two pieces of floral fabric from uh, the trash can at uh, Chipman Street. Uh, the rest of the uh, pieces that I looked at of the floral fabric, I was not able to make a fracture match, but I was able to look at, there was a, a um, intact uh, piece of uh, floral fabric there that I was able to take those pieces, some of them had been burned, and I was able to kind of align those up to, to where they would have matched on a, a similar uh, piece of that fabric, and so I was able to say that those were consistent with coming from a, a piece of fabric like that. Based on what type of characteristic did you look at? On oh, those, not the non fracture matches. On these, it would have just been the fact that they were that type of uh, floral pattern and the color. <laughs> Now, you took some pictures of while you are doing this examination. Yes, I, yes, I did. Which would help, help us understand what you did. Or you take a quick look at these six pictures and see if those are the, the pictures that you took. Yes, sir, they are. And, and we'll display them on the big screen. At this time, though, we'd like to move in to 358, 359, 360, 61, 62, and 63. Let them be received into evidence. First picture there, tell us what you're looking at. On the top part there, um, that is uh, a piece of fabric from Shannon Christian's autopsy. And then the uh, two pieces below were partial burn fabric that uh, came from uh, the Newsom autopsy. And what conclusions are you able to make, if any, from this comparison? You can look and see how these patterns line up with, this is the intact, um, <laughs> didn't mean to put an arrow on there necessarily, but these are the patterns that I was looking at between those two. Um, so you can see there's a hem here, and there's a hem in the original one that's intact, and so I basically just lined up where that could have happened in another piece of fabric like that. Consistent with coming from the same whole cloth or something like that. Not this particular cloth, but another cloth like it. Okay. And exhibit 359? Same type of thing. Uh, I found that area where that pattern is the same uh, with that area on the one that was intact. And the two pieces of fabric again are from which source? Uh, the top part is from the Christian autopsy, and the bottom one is from uh, the Newsom autopsy. Exhibit 360? Yes, this is, um, there were two pieces of, of uh, fabric that were from Chipman Street that fracture matched. This would be the right side, the end of the right side of that piece of fabric that matched to uh, the, the Christian autopsy. And, and this is a fracture match along that line. You can see not only do you have a, a nice jagged edge there that corresponds across that fracture line, but you also have the pattern that goes across there. So you can tell that those two items were at one time, one piece. And again, the one on the left is from the Chicken Street uh, house. Yes. The one on the right from the Christian autopsy. Correct. 
And those are the two pieces uh, from the Chipman Street, and those are that's a fracture match between those two. Again, you can see uh, how that jagged line adds uh, adds up between the two of them, uh, corresponds, and that uh, also the pattern across that line corresponds. So those two pieces were at one time joined. That's exhibit 361. And then this would be the other side of those pieces of fabric. Uh, and that, the one on the right would be from Chipman Street and the one from the left would be from uh, the uh, Christian autopsy. And again, those fracture match along that line uh, with the corresponding fracture line and the pattern that goes across it. So those two pieces were at one time joined. Last exhibit 363. Okay, these two, uh, the, the top and the bottom piece here are from the railroad tracks. Um, and then the pieces in the middle were from uh, the Christian autopsy. And where I wasn't able to fracture match those, uh, you can kind of tell that there's there's a small piece of a strip missing between those, but you can kind of see where they these would uh, line up um, if those little pieces were not missing. I had those pieces, I think, that you could possibly get a fracture match? I don't know if I would have been able to fracture match these because these lines are um, pretty straight across. They look like they were ripped pretty straight, uh, but I think I would have been able to associate them uh, you know, closer that these patterns matched. Uh, they still probably would have ultimately just said they were consistent with this all coming from the, the same uh, piece of fabric. In any event, these three pieces are the same a color consistency pattern. Yes. Those types of things you look to. Yeah, they are consistent. You, did you prepare a report that summarized your findings? I did. On that approach. It's been marked Exhibit 420 and ask you if that's a true and exact copy of your report. Yes, sir, it is. Right. So we'll move Exhibit 420 <coughs> into evidence. that was collected at these various crime scenes, it appears that it was torn, is that correct? Not uh, cut? Parts of it appear to be torn. I didn't do a test on whether it was cut or torn. Um, the pieces that I fracture matched, it's possible that those could have been cut at one time um, mm -hmm. because tearing them across the non-bias might be a little harder than the longer strips. Uh, but again, I didn't do any testing to, to see if they had been cut or torn. Gotcha. And so, Part of what you do is, is you do a visual inspection of the exhibits, is that correct? Uh, yes. And I guess that'd be the first thing that you do is to see first visually, hey, does this look like this is the same, comes from the same potential source, correct? Yeah, I identify everything that I have, write up notes about it, and then if there's something that looks similar, yes, I, I do more testing. And of course, all these items, is, these are commercially <clears throat> available. These aren't homemade sheets as far as you can tell. Uh, yes, that's correct. And just so I understand, as far as the ones at the railroad tracks, from what you can tell, they're consistent at least in appearance with the other items, but you can't tell that they came from the same source. Is that correct? That's correct. <coughs> and I guess I'll pass the witness this time, Your Honor. No further questions. You can step down. Thank you. Should be excused, please. Thank you. No. Thank you, sir. Lisa Greer. solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Please have a seat. Please give us your name. Lisa Greer. Miss uh, Greer, can you spell your last name, please? G-R-E-E-R. -E -E Where are you from? <clears throat> Not well, I'm from Illinois. 
Carbondale, right. Illinois, but I've been here since 2003. And uh, ma'am, if I can direct your attention back to January 2007, uh, were you living here in Knoxville? Yes. Where were you living at? Ridgeboro. And uh, did you, do you know or did you know of a person by the name of Eric Boyd? Yes. What name did you know him by? E. Uh, exhibit uh, 426. Do you recognize Exhibit 426? Mm -hmm. What is uh, 426? Ooh. Is that where you live? Yes. Is that, okay, that's Ridgebrook Apartments. Mm -hmm. So for the record, we are seeking to move into evidence Exhibit 426 and 427. I think 427 is just. All right, let them be received in evidence. Uh, did you also know any someone by the name of uh, Danielle Lightfoot? Yes. Did you know her as Danielle or Kathleen? Danielle. Um, at the time, did you have a sister at the time? Yes. And she, what was your sister's name? Lakeisha Rear. Has she passed? Yes. Uh, and Lakeisha Rear, did Lakeisha Rear also know Danielle Lightfoot? Yes. And did Lakeisha Rear also know Mr. Boyd? Yes. Now, did you? Where did you live? In Bridgeport, did you live alone or did you live with someone? I live with my sister. And where was your apartment, I guess, in relationship to Miss Lightfoot? Uh, it was an apartment right in the middle of us, and then I was on the other side of the apartment building. So it was a, like two apartments down. Well, actually one apartment down. Okay. Where was your apartment in relationship to Mr. Boyd's mom's? His mom stayed on the end. We stayed right by the office, so like, Five, six apartments down, seven, maybe. And uh, if I could, I want to direct your attention back to the first week of January 2007, or the second week of January 2007. You want to look at this map, just to orient yourself with the days. Do you recall uh, encountering Mr. Boyd and Mr. Davidson at some point in time in January 2007? Yes. Okay. Tell us what you recall about that. Well, as of January 7th, um, I was coming home from work and I was stopping by Danielle's to see what she was doing. And um, I knocked on the door and then nobody answered. But I seen like foots under the, I didn't even see the like foot, like people walking past. I just thought she didn't want to be bothered. So I went home. And like, probably like 10, 15 minutes later, my sister came home, nervous, anxious, and I'm asking her, what's wrong? And she was... I'm objecting to your side. It's what the sister said. So, so you have, you're fine. You had a conversation with your sister. Yes. Right. After you had your conversation with your sister, what did you do? I just sat down on the couch and was about to listen to what she had to say. Okay. Um, and she talked to you. I'm trying yes. to avoid getting in what she told you. Oh, okay. And so she, she talked to you? Yes. Okay, and then what did you do or what did you say after that? What's wrong? Why are you so nervous? All right, and then what did you do? I sat down and she was getting ready to tell me what happened. Okay, and she told you? Yes. Okay, and after that conversation, did you do something? No. Okay. Uh, did I you don't recall, you? no. That's fine. What happened after you had a conversation with your sister? I can't recall. Okay. I know. I've thrown you off. Think about you had a conversation with your sister. I don't recall. Okay. That's fine. And then did you leave your apartment or did you stay in your apartment? I stayed. Okay. And at some point in time, you came to realize that Mr. Boyd and Mr. Davidson were taking the custody? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't did you know someone by the name of Kamara Kayatu? Mm -mm. I don't
Can I come? Okay. Yeah, just please raise your right hand first. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Please have a seat. Please give us your name. My name is Kariatu Kamara. Okay, can you scoot up a little bit closer to the microphone? My name is Kariatu Kamara. Can you spell your last name, please? K-A-M-A-R-A. -A -A. And uh, can you spell your first name? K-A-D-I-A-T-U. Uh, Ms. Kamara, um, what country are you from originally? I'm from Sierra Leone, West Africa. And how long have you been here in the United States? About 13 to 14 years. Directing your attention back to January 2007, uh, where were you living? I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. And, and what, uh, what apartment complex back in 2007 did you live in? Um, Ridgebrook. Now, who did you live in Ridgebrook with? I live with my cousin. Okay. And did you have a vehicle? Yes. What type of vehicle did you have? I have a Dodge vehicle, green color. Was it a car, a truck, a van, or an SUV? It's a van. Now, did you have any children? Yes. And uh, how many children did you have? Five. And uh, was there a particular morning that Thursday, January 11th, that your daughter had a, a dentist appointment? Yes. Now, did you know Mr. Boyd at the time? Yes. And uh, how did you know Mr. Boyd? He usually be my neighbor before. He was your neighbor? Mm -hmm. um, so, do you remember uh, getting stopped by the police on the morning of or the afternoon of January 11, 2007? Yes. What can you tell us about that day? Well, that day I have, um, I mean, my daughter, she have a doctor appointment, dentist appointment. Your daughter had a dentist appointment? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I was in, on my bedroom in that morning, and uh, uh, I, was in, I, I was talking to somebody in Africa. Then I had um, a boy voice knock my door. He was talking to my daughter and ask uh, why she's not in school on that particular day. Then my daughter replied to him. He said, I have a dentist appointment. So I step out at the living room. So I, uh, I almost, I mean, also answered Eric, the same answer that I said, she have doctor appointment. Then I said, they have a dentist appointment. Then he asked me, do you have somebody to take you? I said, no. He said, I will help you. He said, we're going to use your van. So I said, no. I said, because I don't have insurance and driver's license. He said, I will help you. Then Eric um, left for a few minutes. Then he came back. So it's the time for us to go. My daughter, she was at the living room. Then we left the um, the apartment. I mean the 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 house, the the apartment. Yes. On the way going downstairs, we saw a lady. Then she asked me, "Can I have a ride?" Then first Eric talked to me. He said the lady need a ride. Then I said okay. So we give a ride to this lady. On the way going on Western Avenue, we passed the cemetery. Then we saw the police pull us out. And so who all was in the van when the police stopped you? <coughs> Me, Eric, and my daughter, and the lady that we gave the ride. And who was driving your van? Eric. 
And where were you seated at in the van? I was sitting on the passenger side. And where was your daughter? She was on the back. And the other lady? Yes. Where was she at? The other lady? Yes, ma'am. If I know where she is now? No, ma'am. Where was she at in the van? Was she seated behind you or yeah. behind Mr. Ford? Behind uh, Eric. Okay. And uh, did the police talk to you there at the scene? Yes. When they stopped, they, when, when they stopped, they stopped we because I never have any problem like that before. So I was I feel like I was nerv nervous. So the police, the the FBI, they flashed me a card. They said if they want information, if I lie to them, I'm gonna go to prison for five years. So they asked me if they show me a picture of um, a lady and um, uh, they said they are looking for them. Do you know them? I said no. I don't know them. Then the police took uh, uh, Eric out from the van. And, and, and did you have to stay there with the van while Eric was taken away? Yes, we stayed there because the appointment should be by one. We stayed there up to five, five o'clock. Did your daughter miss her appointment? Yes. <clears throat> Miss Kamara? Yes. What was the the plan when Eric Eric was going to take you and your daughter to the dentist? Mm -hmm. And then what was he going to do with the van? Well, we we plan to return back home with my daughter. Was he going to stay there at the dentist office with you? Um, because I don't know how to drive. I don't know because my plan is like you will take me after the appointment We have to return back home okay. Thank you okay. Mr. Frazier is going to ask you some questions, okay? Okay Fine Now you had known Mr. Boyd for some time, is that right? Yes uh, as a neighbor? Yes. And um, would you say that there were times where he would try to be helpful with you and your daughter? Yes, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to take you to this dentist appointment and then bring you back, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you said that you had to stay there after the police took Eric away. Um, did they bring him back at some point in time? Yes. Okay. And um, I, I, and at that point in time, when he came back to the van, did you all have to wait for someone else to drive you back? Um, after the police, they take him back mm -hmm. to the van. So he asked me, you want to drive my van again? So I told him, I said, no, you cannot drive my van anymore. And you all had to wait for someone who had a license? Yeah, to the lady inside the car, she's the one who has license okay. and take me home back. And the, and the lady who that y'all were giving a ride to, um, she was just somebody who lived there in Ridgebrook, is that right? I don't even know her. Didn't even know who she was? No. Any reason to think she was connected with Mr. Boyd? Excuse me? Any reason to think that she was connected with Mr. Boyd? Well, I don't know, because sooner I approached to my, to my van for us to go to the appointment, so I think the lady talked to Eric. So Eric said, I'm not, not the one who have the vehicle. So she's the one who have the vehicle. So the lady talked to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she was just standing there. She asked him, and he said, "Look, it's not my car." Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, okay. Sir. No further questions. You're welcome. Okay. You can step down. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Sir. <clears throat> hey, are she free to free to leave? No. She's free to go. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Just for Nelson. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat.
It's Jennifer Millsaps. J E N N I F E R M I L L S A P S. Who do you work for? I'm employed by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. And what are your duties? I'm a special agent forensic scientist. I'm currently assigned to the Knoxville Forensic Biology Unit. How long have you been a forensic scientist? Uh, around 17 years. And tell us about your educational background and training in your field. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biochemistry from Maribel College. I have a Master of Science degree from Life Sciences in the, from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. In addition, I completed in-house training at TBI under the direction of court qualified analysts in the field of forensic biology. I'm also a member of the Violent Crimes Response Team and currently serve as a team leader. And have you uh, testified as an expert in forensic serology and DNA analysis in courts in Tennessee? Yes, I have. State and federal court? Yes. And over the years, have you analyzed many samples sent to you from the presence of, in this case, DNA? Yes, I have. We would uh, move Agent Millsaps in as an expert in forensic serology and DNA analysis. Did I say that correctly? Yes. The objection, please. I don't have an objection to be her, uh, to her being tended as an expert, but I do think there is one matter I'd like to take up outside of the jury's presence before we go on with the direct examination. All right. Uh, at this point, the court, for the record, the court does recognize uh, Special Agent Jennifer Miller, Millsap, as an expert in the field of forensic serology and DNA analysis. Um, if there's a matter that's apparently come up, I'll have to take out, out have to take up outside your presence. Please go with your court officer. I'll bring you back as soon as I can. You can be seated. asking the state, one of the items that was submitted for testing would be clothing that was collected from Mr. Boyd. Now this clothing has been examined and has been looked at. There's a number of stains on this clothing, Your Honor. Most of the stains are attributed to uh, Eric Boyd as far as being his DNA. One of the other things that I do think is significant is that the victims in this case their samples were submitted and they were excluded as being present on any of the stains that were tested by Ms. Millsaps and, and by Agent Millsaps in regards to um, whether or not their DNA was present. They were excluded on almost every single one that could be examined. Um, and I don't, you know, if we were going to stop there, I would say, okay, that's fine. Because this, again, there there is... Just to be clear, there is sperm that is found on the clothing. Uh, again, this is not the victim's. It is, in general, it's Mr. Boyd's. However, there is one stain on the leg that is actually a mixture of sperm as well as non-sperm. And of course, there's a stain, and I'm referring to stain number three. That has a DNA of an unknown male individual, which we feel is not relevant at all to bring up in, in this case. But I can tell the court that this was excluded as being the DNA of Shannon Christian, Newsom, Latavius Cobbins, George Thomas, Eric Boyd, Vincent Wehrmark, Marcus Davidson, Vanessa Coleman, Daphne Sutton, Rhonda Dukes, or Stacy Jo Lawson. In a sense, we have no idea who this is. It comes from, again, a, a stain that is a mixture of the sperm and non-sperm fractions. I just find it Prejudicial. I don't see that there's any relevance. This is a stain on, on the clothing that was he was taken into custody with. And that was submitted for testing back in 2000. It wasn't tested. The report was issued in December of 2015. And I believe it was received 
in May of 2014, and they tested numerous locations on these clothing. This would be his gray jacket, his black shoes, his clothing, is, and again, uh, as well as pants. I just don't see that there is any, any relevance at all in this case, and I would find, that, I just think that it would be prejudicial. I don't, I don't know who this is, I don't know what this is, it's a mixture, it doesn't mean anything, but the fact that you say stain, sperm, unknown male, I think, again, given the rumors and innuendo that were involved in the community in regards to Mr. Wood, I think this is prejudicial, and I don't think that the jury, again, I don't have too much of an objection to most of this report coming in, but for that particular stain, I just don't see the relevance, if there's any reference to that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. What's your stage there? Good. The, uh, Ms. Millsaps is going to talk about all the items of evidence that were submitted to her lab to determine the presence of DNA. Everybody. There was a lot submitted. It wasn't anybody's DNA. And we, that's, that's throughout all these exhibits, probably hundreds of them. But we're focusing on the items of evidence that were sent to the lab that contain anybody's DNA that's related to this case. That's what we're focusing on. Is the DNA, can you say the DNA is from someone related to this case? The, um, from, I'm not, not sure I understand what he's objecting to. But I think from, what he's objecting to is that he's telling the court that that stain is, 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 did not connect anyone involved in this case. It didn't connect to it. Oh, that's what's going well, it, it's, I think that's what they're saying. It, it doesn't connect Mr. Boyd to anyone else in the case. In other words, I think they're objecting to just generally trying to characterize Mr. Boyd as a promiscuous person who just has sex with people all over the place. But it, it's his DNA on his shirt. That, that, I think that's what the item is. I thought, you, I thought you said that they could identify it to anyone. Your Honor. Specifically, what I'm referencing is stain number three on a pair of black jeans. They tested his clothing, and they did find different stains on other pieces of clothing. Most of the stains are attributable to Mr. Boyd, and some of them would be what they would call sperm and non-sperm fractions. Again, and uh, I know Ms. Millsaps, I believe, and I have talked about it, that the presence of sperm. I'm on the wrong page. Which, which I'm on page seven. I'm on the report issued on December 8, 2015, page 7, stain number three. Oh, three. Talk about stain number eight. Well, stain number eight comes back to Mr. Boyd. I don't have any objection. I mean, the fact that there's a mixture on the, on the inside crotch of his pants, that it comes back to Mr. Boyd, that, that I, that I don't see how that's prejudicial. My concern is that there's going to be, it says DNA profile of an unknown male individual. And again, it's a mixture. This doesn't even necessarily mean. Um, she can explain that, don't you? Yeah, but what's the point? Well, what's Why the, even get into it? What's the state's position? Okay. Uh, there, I mean, there are other items that, if I recall the reports correctly, that, that had unknown, you know, male unknown, whatever. I mean, these are throughout the reports, unidentified. Certainly not connected to this case. Just, yeah. I'm recalling maybe something from the the car that was you know, swapped from the car, their unknown male. Well, I mean, that could be any passenger for whatever. I mean, that, that, that's the type of evidence that that is. It's nothing. Well, all right, given the fact that this case is all about, or at least partly about, multiple acts of rape, yeah. and given the fact that the specimen, the specimen you're talking about was found on Mr. Boyd's clothing, given that, the court would have to find it. It's circumstantial, certainly, but it, there is probative value in it. And I do not find that the evidence is so, within the context of this case, the court cannot find that the evidence is so uh, 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 inflammatory, uh, that the inflammatory quality of the evidence uh, exceeds the probative value. So. I, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm, it's just in the report. I'm not going to talk about it. I argue that or anything. But that's, that's one of my questions. That's what I asked the state. Um, it's in the report, but I had asked the state if they were going to talk about it, if they were going to bring it up, if they were going to point it out. Well, it's in the report. Well, if it's in the report. For the sake of inclusion, I'm going to allow the state to, to briefly mention everything that the, 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 the expert witness found. 
apparently the Kent State not that didn't make much out of it. There's not a whole lot you can make. Yeah, we, we plan to introduce all the reports. I'm not going to ask her about all of them. I'm just showing the thoroughness of her testing. Well, I don't have an objection to that. It's just I didn't want them to make a big deal about the fact of this particular thing. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. But we're going to introduce it, though. He's He's going to do. He can come in and edit it. So I find it the probative value does exceed any danger of unfair prejudice. All right, let's bring him in. Now, for scheduling purposes, our next witness is Dr. Lucy, and she is going to be very long. So I didn't know if you wanted us, I think that Jennifer's going to be a little long, and lunch is supposed to be here at 11.50. We won't need uh, the doctor until at least 1 o'clock. And maybe, maybe not quite then, I'm not sure. You can be seated. Stay away to talk? Yes. Defense way to talk? Yes, sir. You can be seated, Jennifer. Uh, take the middle staff, I'll move forward and throw it here briefly. Uh, you have been qualified as an expert in the field of forensic serology and DNA analysis. Tell the, the, the jury uh, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about DNA. DNA itself is a chemical that's found in your body and it serves as sort of a blueprint or set of instructions for how your body is made. And do any two people have the same DNA? Uh, with respect to forensic DNA profile, with the exception of identical twins, no two people would have the same DNA profile. And can you tell us how the uh, field of DNA analysis has progressed through the years to where it's become an accepted science in criminal justice? I'm not sure I understand your uh, question. A very good question. Uh, at DNA, when did it, it first uh, become uh, an investigative tool in criminal cases? I would say uh, earlier iter iterations of it probably in the early 90s. Um, the current science we're using now probably started around 98, 2000, somewhere in there. And has that been your uh, field of expertise primarily ever since then? Yes. Now, uh, where do you uh, do your testing, your DNA testing? I'm, I'm employed at the Knoxville Forensic uh, Laboratory with TBI. And is that lab certified? Yes. And how long has it been certified? A uh, number of years. Okay. I'll ask you then, of course, you're here because you've analyzed certain items of evidence in this case uh, over a long period of time. You know approximately how many different items you may have uh, analyzed, looked at, analyzed in this case. I believe the laboratories received close to 100 pieces of evidence, and I've analyzed many of those. And you know approximately how many hours you have spent analyzing evidence in this case? I do not. So it be in the hundreds? If not the thousands, yes. Now let's talk about the items you received into your lab. Um, and I want to focus on I guess probably the first report you may have rendered in this case, dated March 12, 2007. If we could refer to that report, do you have that in front of you? I do. And tell the jury what items of evidence you received into the lab for analysis. On this report, I have a known blood standard from Shannon Christian, vaginal swabs and slide from Shannon Christian, anal swabs from Shannon Christian, oral swabs from Shannon Christian, a known blood sample from Hugh Christopher Newsom, rectal swabs from Hugh Christopher Newsom, oral swabs also from Hugh Christopher Newsom, a white tank top from Shannon Christian, a striped shirt from Shannon Christian, pieces of floral fabric, pieces of pink fabric, buccal swabs from Latalvis Cobbins, buccal swabs from George Thomas, buccal swabs from Eric Boyd, Buccal swabs from Vincent Warnemont, a swab from a living room panel, a swab from a living room doorway, a swab from a bedroom, a swab from a front bedroom lower south wall, a blue rug from between the bedroom and the bath, a swab from the north wall in the kitchen, buccal swabs from Lamarcus Davidson, buccal swabs from Vanessa Coleman, buccal swabs from Daphne Sutton, Buccal swabs from Rhonda Dukes and buccal swabs from J.C. Excuse me, Stacy Joe Lawson. I may approach with 
envelopes and boxes. First of all, let me hand this box that's been marked Exhibit 385. See if you recognize that box. This is the sexual assault kit that contains items from Shannon Christian, and it has my lab identifier on it. Okay, and would that contain the uh, uh, some of the swabs that you <coughs> kind of read off there a minute ago? Yes. Which ones would they contain? That would be the blood standard, vaginal swabs, anal swabs, and oral swabs, all from Shannon Christian. And that's from the sexual assault kit? Yes. correct? We'd move exhibit 385 as evidence. It's not already been moved. Okay. Exhibit 386. See if you recognize that on the road. This has uh, a numb blood sample, rectal swabs, and oral swabs from uh, Hugh Christopher Newsom inside. And here's my identifier. Okay. And both of these items, uh, were they received in the lab in a sealed condition? Yes. And were they unsealed by you when you did your examination? Yes. We moved 386 into the evidence. Okay. Let it be received. packages. First of all, exhibit 374. Recognize that. This is my exhibit 15A, which is a white tank top from Shannon Christian. Okay. And my identifier is right here. And just for the record, we have previously opened that, but did it come to your lab in a sealed condition? Yes. Prior to your analysis? Yes. We move exhibit 374 into evidence. Okay. And exhibit 384. You recognize that? This is the striped shirt from Shannon Christian. And this is my identifier on the package. We move exhibit 384 into evidence. Okay. Let be received. Exhibit 443, I believe. It's, I think it's marked. This is a uh, pair of blue jeans, and my identifier is right here. Let's see where those blue jeans were recovered from. Uh, from 2316 Shipman Street. And this is 443. This is um, some clothing items uh, from Eric Boyd. And it's my exhibit 11A. And my identifier is right here on the sticker. Are those uh, clothing items identified any more specifically, either from your notes or from the bag itself? Yes, the, the bag says uh, one jacket gray, one shirt yellow, one belt black, and two shoes Nike black. And leave that right here for right now. That is exhibit 441. We've moved that into evidence. Okay. Let it be received. Exhibit 430. Recognize that. Uh, 
This is my exhibit 94A. It's a holster from the Pontiac Sunbird, and my identifier is right here. Okay. Move exhibit 430 into evidence. Another package. This is uh, my exhibit 12A, which is a uh, Clothing from Eric Boyd in the bag says two socks white, two socks black, one shirt tank top black, one thermal pants gray, one pants that are black, one underwear that's gray, uh, a nickel, and a key ring with two keys. Okay. Is it 440? Right there. Let Now let's talk about your examination of these uh, Looking back on the report, tell us what you examined and tell us what you concluded. From the uh, vaginal swabs, the examination revealed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, no DNA profile other than the victim was obtained, and that would be Shannon Christian. Uh, from the sperm fraction, Based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile matches Exhibit 1A, or Shannon Christian. The minor contributor of the profile matches Exhibit 68A, or Lamarcus Davidson. From the minor contributor profile, the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current world population. So that vaginal swab, and, and these swabs from the sexual assault kits, will they have the victim's DNA? Yes. Most likely in every case? Yes. And in this particular case for the vaginal swab, then we have the victim's DNA, Ms. Christian, and Mr. Davidson's DNA, is that correct? That's correct. And you say, chance of that being anybody else exceeding the world population? That's correct. Uh, let's move on to the next item. Okay. And the anal swabs from Shannon Christian. The examination revealed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, no DNA profile other than the victim was obtained. <coughs> from the sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile is consistent with Exhibit 68A, Lamarcus Davidson. There are three locations he couldn't be excluded as a contributor to the profile. Uh, the minor contributor of the profile is consistent with Exhibit 1A, or Shannon Christian, and at three locations she couldn't be excluded as the contributor to the profile. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile as the major contributor from the African American population is approximately one in 57 million. The Caucasian population is approximately one in 1.2 billion. The Southeastern Hispanic is approximately one in 472 million. And the Southwestern Hispanic is approximately one in 510 million. So the anal swab contained the victim's DNA and Mr. Davidson's sperm. Is that the way? Is that a correct way? To interpret that or not? It's found in the sperm fraction, so I believe it probably would be from sperm. And I failed to mention on that first sample as well, the vaginal swab came from the sperm fraction as well, is that correct? That's correct. Let's move on to the oral swab from Shannon Christian. Okay. From the oral swabs, the examination revealed the presence of semen but not spermatozoa. From the non sperm fraction, no profile other than the victim was obtained. From the sperm fraction, the DNA profile is consistent with the mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile matches Exhibit 1A, or Shannon Christian. The minor contributor of the profile is consistent with Exhibit 16A, or Latalvis Cobbins. And there were five locations that were inconclusive. For the minor profile contributor, the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African American population is approximately one in 454 million. Caucasian is approximately one in 70 billion. Southeastern Hispanic is approximately one in 51 billion. 
Southwestern Hispanic is approximately one in 238 billion. So in some review on the oral swab from Shannon Christian had her DNA and Mr. Cobb's DNA in the sperm fraction, is that correct? Yes. Moving on to the rectal swab from Mr. Hughes. From the rectal swab, the examination revealed the presence of semen but not spermatozoa and no DNA profile other than the victim was obtained. And was there additional testing from another lab that, that uh, this sample was subject to? I believe another lab did some uh, additional YSTR testing on this sample. And do you know the results from that YSTR testing? I believe the results were no profile other no than profile. the victim was obtained. Same, I guess same result that you had, had determined, is that correct? Yes. Let's move on to the white tank top from Shannon Christian, lab number, lab exhibit 15A. Okay. What did you find there? From the white tank top, there's actually two stains, uh, and I labeled them exhibit A and B, so I'll talk about them separately. Uh, stain A, examination revealed the presence of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, Based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material of at least two individuals. Major contributor of the profile matches Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian, but information regarding the minor contributor was inconclusive. From the sperm fraction of that same sample, um, based on the, these results, the DNA profile matches Exhibit 16A or Latalvis Cobbins. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current rule population. Excuse me, what swab is that? That is uh, actually from the tank top. That's um, stain A from the tank top. Yeah, I think we have some photographs maybe that will show exactly where on the shirt stain A was taken from. Yes. We'll show those in minutes, is that correct? Yes. And a photograph of the next one, which would be stain B, is So it's a stain B, also from the white tank top. Uh, exam revealed the presence of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material, where the major contributor of the profile is consistent with 16A or Latavis Cobbins. Information regarding the minor was inconclusive. From the sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile matched exhibit 16A or Latalvis Cobbins, and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the four population groups I mentioned earlier exceeds the current world population. So with the summary from the white tank top, with two stains there, the mixture of uh, Shannon Christian's DNA and Latalvis Cobbins' DNA, yes. sperm fraction on both of those? The sperm fraction being the, Mr. Cobbins on both of those. Yes. Moving on to the striped shirt from Shannon Christian. With the striped shirt, I also looked at two different stains, and so I'll go through the process of each stain one at a time. Uh, stain A, the exam revealed the presence of spermatozoa. Uh, from the non-sperm fraction, the profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material from at least two individuals where exhibits 1A, Shannon Christian, and 16A, Latavis Cobbins are consistent with being the contributors. From the sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile matched exhibit 16A or Latavis Cobbins. And the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from those four population groups exceeds the current world population. From stain B, also from the striped shirt, uh, exam revealed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile matches exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian, and information regarding the minor contributor was inconclusive. So two stains then on that striped shirt, First one being your stain A would be a mixture of Shannon Christian and Talbot Cobbins, is that correct? Yes, from the non sperm fraction. And stain B was a mixture, but the only one you could detect would be Shannon Christian. Uh, stain B, uh, yes, was a 
from the non-sperm fraction, well, the major contributor was Shannon Christian, and from the sperm fraction, which I haven't read yet, uh, the DNA profile obtained was inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. I apologize, I may have got hit, but there was a sperm fraction, but there was just not, what, not enough DNA or, to, or not enough to, to, to make a call on that? Correct. Now, moving on to the uh, floral fabric that you received in, from the Shannon Christian autopsy. Can you tell us what you did with that item? Uh, yes, and I located eight stains on this fabric, and so I'll go through these uh, one by one. Uh, stain A, exam revealed the presence of a spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of at least three individuals. The major contributor uh, matches exhibit 70A, or Vanessa Coleman. At least one of the minor contributors is a male, but no additional information could be determined. From the sperm fraction, excuse me, let me read the, for the major profile contributor stats there, the probability of an unrelated individual having that same DNA profile from any of those four population groups exceeds the current rule population. From the sperm fraction of that same stain, based on these results, the DNA profile matched exhibit 16A or Latalvis Cobbins and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from those four population groups exceeds the current world population. So that stain was a mixture of Vanessa Coleman and the Talbot Cobbins? She was in the non-sperm fraction, he was in the sperm fraction. Okay. Next stain? So stain B uh, also revealed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. In the non-sperm fraction, a female profile was indicated, but no additional information was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. From the sperm fraction, uh, the DNA profile obtained is consistent with exhibit 16A or Latalvis Cobbins, and the probability uh, of an unrelated individual having that same DNA profile from either of those four population groups exceeds the current world population. Next stain. Stain C. Uh, also revealed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. In the non-sperm fraction, a female profile was indicated that all of the loci were inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. From the sperm fraction, no DNA profile was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. Next stain. Stain D uh, revealed the presence of spermatozoa. In the non-sperm fraction, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture the major contributor is consistent with Exhibit 78 of Vanessa Coleman, and information regarding the minor contributor was inconclusive. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African American population was approximately 1 in 324 million, Caucasian population was approximately 1 in 662 million, Southeastern Hispanic was 1 in 609 million, in the southwestern Hispanic is approximately one in 304 million. So that stain was Vanessa Colton and Latalvis Cobbins? Well, that was the non-sperm fraction, but the sperm fraction is matched to Latalvis Cobbins. Non-sperm for Vanessa Colton, sperm for Latalvis Cobbins. Right, and the, the stats in the sperm fraction uh, also exceed the world population. Next thing, stain E. All right, stain E was a limited number of spermatozoa. In the non-sperm fraction, a female profile was indicated that all information was inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. In the sperm fraction, the DNA profile obtained was inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. Okay. Okay. Stain, Stain F, exam revealed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile matched exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either of those four population groups exceeds the current world population. From the sperm fraction, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture. The major contributor matched Shannon Christian, but information regarding the minor was inconclusive. And the probability uh, of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile also exceeded the current world population for those four groups. And again, this is the same piece of fabric that you found these previous stains on, is that correct? I believe so. It was a grouping of fabric, um, but I have to relook at the photographs. So uh, uh, through these stains anyway, we have Mr. Cobbins, Ms. Coleman, and now Ms. Christian's DNA. 
Yes. Right. What about stain G? Stain G, exam revealed the presence of a limited number of sperm. From the non-sperm fraction, uh, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile matches 1A or Shannon Christian. The minor contributor of the profile matches 70A or Vanessa Coleman. From the major contributor profile, the probability of an unrelated individual having that same DNA profile from those four population groups exceeds the current world population. From the minor contributor profile, the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from any of those four groups exceeds the current world population. From the sperm fraction of that sample, uh, the DNA profile is consistent with 16A or Latalvis Cobbins. In the remaining locations, three were inconclusive. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African American population is approximately 1 in 10,190. The Caucasian population is approximately 1 in 9,653. Southeastern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 12,110. <laughs> In a southwestern Hispanic, it's approximately one in 6,863. So, from that stain, I understand we then have Vanessa Coleman and Shannon Christian as a mixture of DNA, and then the sperm uh, fraction from Mr. Cobbins on that one stain? Yes. <coughs> stain and H? Stain H also revealed the presence of a limited number of sperm. Based on these results, the DNA profile from both the non-sperm and sperm fractions matched 1A or Shannon Christian. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from any of those four population groups exceeds the current world population. And that's they only have Shannon Christian's DNA, is that correct? That's correct. Contained within that, that report, if I just kind of summarize it and not uh, reveal any uh, identifiable DNA on those particular items, is that a fair way to finish out that report? I mean, there, there were other items that had DNA on them. Okay. But if you could, just of the, the rest of those items on there, if you could kind of look those over and tell us what items have any DNA of anybody connected to this case. Okay. Just kind of in summary fashion, if you could. Okay. Um, in my exhibit 21A, the swab from the living room panel, uh, that one had presumptive tests indicate the presence of blood, and the profile matched Lamarcus Davidson. And the stats there were uh, greater than the world population for those four population groups. Uh, 22A, swab from the living room doorway. Uh, presumptive tests indicate the presence of blood. Further tests indicate the presence of human DNA. Uh, the DNA their profile there matched exhibit Lamar or 68A, Lamarcus Davidson. And the probability uh, there also exceeded the world population for those four groups. Uh, for 23A, swab from the bedroom. Presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further tests indicated the presence of human DNA. Uh, the DNA profile matched 68A, Lamarcus Davidson. And the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from any of those groups exceeded the current world population. Exhibit 50A, which is the front bedroom lower south wall swab. Uh, presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further tests indicated the presence of human DNA. And the DNA profile obtained matched Lamarcus Davidson. And uh, the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile also exceeded the world population for those four groups. Uh, from Exhibit 54A, or the blue rug, uh, presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Uh, the DNA profile obtained was consistent with Exhibit 70B, or Daphne Sutton. 
and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile for many of those four groups exceeded the current world population. 61A, the swab from the north wall, resumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further tests indicated the presence of human DNA. <coughs> DNA profile matched Lamarcus Davidson, and the probability there also exceeded the current world population for all four groups. <coughs> Ask you to look at Exhibit 312 and tell us whether or not that's true and exact copy of your report. As it relates to these items you testified. Yes. We move Exhibit 312 into evidence. No objection. Let it be received. Moving on to the next report, which uh, summarizes your results from testing of other items. This uh, report uh, date issued July 7th, uh, testing on blue jeans and a white towel and a trash can. Are those are three items you examined yes. for that report. Tell yes. us about it. I didn't run it. Say yes, it is. Oh, okay. Now tell us what you did on, on those items. Okay. Uh, from the blue jeans, I had five stains that I looked at and uh, so from two of those cuttings, uh, they had the same results. I reported them together. So for cuttings A and C, the exam revealed the presence of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile matched Exhibit 1A, or Shannon Christian, and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from any of those four groups exceeded the current world population. From the sperm fraction from those two cuttings, uh, based on these results, the DNA profile matched Exhibit 68A, or Lamarcus Davidson. Probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from any of those four groups exceeded the current world population. From cutting B, the exam revealed the presence of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction of that sample, Based on these results, the DNA profile matched Exhibit 1A, or Shannon Christian, and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile matched, or excuse me, exceeded the current world population for those four groups. From the sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile matched Exhibit 16A, or Latalvis Cobbins, and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from any of those four groups exceeded the current world population. So for those two stains, as I understand, had uh, Shannon Christian's DNA, uh, and stain A had Marcus Davidson's DNA from the sperm fraction, and stain B for Shannon Christian and the sperm fraction, we Mr. Collins. Actually, uh, stains A and C have, or reported out together, and so uh, they both have uh, Lamarcus Davidson in the sperm fraction, and then cutting B, uh, the sperm fraction is Latavis Cobbins. Uh, stains, e, yeah, stains D and E also have the same results, so I reported them together. Uh, presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further test indicated the presence of human DNA. Based on these results, the DNA profile obtained is consistent with Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian and the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African-American population is approximately one in 11 billion. Caucasian is approximately one in 774 million. Southeastern Hispanic was one in one, one billion, and the Southwestern Hispanic is approximately one in 557 million. Also, uh, with, in that report, as part of that reporting process, you examined the uh, trash can that was submitted for testing. Is that correct? Yes. Is this a trash can? Then look at it, see if that's the same trash can that you. It is. My idea is right here on the lid. It is also an ID on the yes. main body of the can as well. There is. Okay. 
And were you able to obtain any results from your testing of that trash can? Uh, the only result was that the exam failed to reveal the presence of semen. I may approach with exhibit 323. <coughs> you tell us if that's a true and accurate copy of your report of July 6, 2007. Yes. Okay. We move that before the end. Where you had uh, analyzed other items, including a bell, inflatable bed, another inflatable bed, and some stains from a vehicle. That you had that report from? I do. Specifically, I want to, I know there's a lot in that, but I want to ask you about what's an RBS, what does that mean? RBS is an abbreviation for a term called reddish brown stain. And there was a reddish brown stain from a forerunner on the right side. Do you have a specific exhibit number for that particular flaw? The, the right side driver's seat? Yes, I'm sorry, right side driver's seat. Uh, that would be my exhibit 71C. Okay. And what were your findings from examination of 71C? From that one, the presumptive tests indicate the presence of blood. Further tests indicate the presence of human DNA. Based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile matches exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian. Information regarding the minor contributor was inconclusive. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile as the major contributor from any of those four population groups exceeds the current world population. So that we can call that blood of Shannon Christian? It's right. presumptively positive for blood. blood in her DNA, and that would be on the right side of the driver's seat, that forerunner. Yes. Where your notes indicate that was taken from. Yes. Is there other testing in that, but is this an accurate copy of that report? Move exhibit 419, I believe. That's the second July 6th. The one that you just referenced. The one that you just talked about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I want to move on to a report dated September 2nd, 2010. Yes, I do. Tell us what items you uh, uh, examined for purposes of that report. Uh, on that report is an XXL Boss sweatshirt and a Sidekick Size 1 holster. Is that the uh, items you identified earlier being in the packaging? I, I know. I'm pretty sure I saw the holster. I don't remember if I saw the sweatshirt or not. Okay. Well, let's talk about the holster. I've left it laying here. Um, you know, Put the gloves on and show us that holster where you can get.
here's this is the holster and this is my original ID. Now tell us uh, where you took samples from that holster. If you can okay. You see the small circ squares of fabric that are missing from the holster, and that's where I would have taken samples uh, for the DNA profile. And would you call that the inside or the outside, or how would you label it? I know my notes, I called it the inside of the holster. I believed it was a part that would have come against someone's skin at that point, so. And uh, you're looking for what we call touch DNA, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, the potential that someone may have left some skin cells behind on the surface of the fabric. And were you able to determine whether or not there was any DNA from those things? Uh, yes. From the holster, uh, the presumptive test failed to indicate the presence of blood. The test indicated the presence of human DNA. Based on these results, a partial DNA profile was obtained, which is consistent with Exhibit 17A, Eric Boyd, at three locations, and the remaining locations were inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. A probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African American population is approximately 1 in 5,714. Caucasian is approximately 1 in 7,905. Southeastern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 8,306. And the Southwestern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 33,560. Is it 314? Is that your report? <laughs> yes. Okay. Move exhibit 314 in, I think. Okay. Holster's <coughs> already been introduced. And if I could refer to your December 8, 2015. Report. We received items from Tim, Tim Shaver, the police department. Is that correct? Yes. More specifically, clothing from Eric Boyd. Yes. And what items did you test there from the presence of the uh, On this one, I have results for uh, Exhibit 11A, which is a gray jacket, yellow t shirt, belt, and shoe insole from Eric Boyd. Black Nike shoes from Eric Boyd, clothing from Eric Boyd, a gray fleece jacket, and a tan and black cloth strip. Uh, what were your results from testing those items? Okay. From Exhibit 11A, uh, included in that exhibit were the following items, the, a gray jacket, a yellow shirt, belt, and a shoe insole. So I'll start with the gray jacket. Alternate light source screening revealed the presence of staining. Presumptive test did not indicate the presence of blood. From stain 25, which was stained from inside of the hood of that jacket, the examination confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the sperm fraction, due to the limited profile obtained, further interpretation was inconclusive. From the non-sperm fraction, also due to the limited profile obtained, further information or interpretation was inconclusive. From the yellow shirt, the alternate life source screening revealed the presence of staining. The presumptive test did not indicate the presence of blood. From stain three, which was the stain from the lower right front of the shirt, the exam confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the sperm fraction, no profile was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. From the non-sperm fraction, a partial DNA profile obtained matched Exhibit 17A, Eric Boyd, at approximately five locations, and all remaining were inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. The probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with the same DNA profile is approximately one in four million for the African American population, one in 18 million for the Caucasian, and one in 163 million for the Southwestern Hispanic population. From stain eight, also from the yellow shirt, uh, and that stain was on the lower middle front of the shirt. 
The exam confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the sperm fraction, no profile was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. And from the non-sperm fraction, partial DNA profile was obtained and matched to exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd at two locations, and all remaining locations were inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. And the probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with that same DNA profile is approximately 1 in 69 for the African American population, 1 in 461 for the Caucasian, 1 in 2,300, excuse me, 2,034 for the Southwestern Hispanic population. Stain 14, which is also from the yellow shirt, and it was from the lower front hem of the shirt. The exam confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa from the sperm fraction. Due to the limited profile obtained, further interpretation was inconclusive. From the non-sperm fraction, a partial profile is obtained as a mixture of at least two individuals. The major contributor matches exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd. And there were four locations inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. The minor contributor profile obtained is only of value for exclusionary purposes. And there's several people that are excluded and I'm just gonna read their names. Uh, Shannon Christian, Hugh Christopher Newsom, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, Vincent Wernemont, Lamarcus Davidson, Vanessa Coleman, Daphne Sutton, Rhonda Dukes, and Stacey Jo Lawson were excluded as contributors to that profile. The probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with the same DNA profile as a major contributor is one in a number greater than the current world population for the African American, Caucasian, and Southwestern Hispanic populations. Stain 15, which was also on the yellow shirt, and it's in the middle front of the shirt over the design. The exam confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. In the sperm fraction, no profile was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. In the non-sperm fraction, the DNA profile obtained is only a value for exclusionary purposes. Due to the limited value of the DNA profile obtained, results regarding the inclusion of Exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd are inconclusive. And there are several people who are excluded as contributors to this profile, and once again, I'll read their names. Shannon Christian, Hugh Christopher Newsom, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, Vincent Wernemont, Lamarcus Davidson, Vanessa Coleman, Daphne Sutton, Rhonda Dukes, and Stacy Jo Lawson. Stain 16, also from the yellow shirt, and this one is from the stain from the lettering that was on the front of the shirt. Confirm the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa, from the sperm fraction, no profile was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. And from the non-sperm fraction, there's a limited DNA profile obtained. It was only a value for exclusionary purposes. And the results regarding the inclusion of Exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd are inconclusive. And once again, I have several people who are excluded, and that would be Shannon Christian, Hugh Christopher Newsom, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, Vincent Ornamont, Lamarcus Davidson, Vanessa Coleman, Daphne Sutton, Rhonda Dukes, and Stacey Jo Lawson. Stain 25 is the last one from the shirt. Um, it's the stain from the inside lower right hem of the shirt. And the exam confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the sperm fraction, no DNA profile was obtained due to insufficient or degraded DNA. And from the non-sperm fraction, the DNA profile obtained is a mixture of at least two individuals. The major contributor matches exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd. The minor contributor profile obtained is only a value for exclusionary purposes. And Shannon Christian, Hugh Christopher Newsom, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, Vincent Wernemont, Lamarcus Davidson, Vanessa Coleman, Daphne Sutton, Rhonda Dukes and Stacey Jo Lawson are excluded as contributors to that profile. The probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with the same DNA profile as the major contributor is one in a number greater than the current world population for the African American, Caucasian, and Southwestern Hispanic populations. Okay. Um, 
from the belt that was also part of that exhibit. Alternate light source screening revealed the presence of staining. From the back of the belt, exam confirmed the presence of a limited number of spermatozoa. From the sperm fraction, the limited DNA profile obtained is only a value for exclusionary purposes. And due to that, results regarding the inclusion of Exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd are inconclusive. And the following exhibits are excluded as contributors to that profile. Shannon Christian, Hugh Christopher Newsom, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, Vincent Wernemont, Lamarcus Davidson, Vanessa Coleman, Daphne Sutton, Rhonda Dukes, and Stacy Jo Lawson. From the non-sperm fraction, the partial DNA profile obtained matched Exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd at three locations and all remaining locations were inconclusive due to insufficient <coughs> or degraded DNA. Probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with the same DNA profile is approximately 1 in 24,000 for the African American population, 1 in 95,000 for the Caucasian, and 1 in 217,000 for the Southwestern Hispanic population. From the front of that belt, the exam confirmed the presence of spermatozoa. From the sperm fraction, partial DNA profile obtained matches exhibit 17A or Eric Boyd, and there were several locations inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. The probability there of randomly selecting an unrelated individual is greater than a world population for those three population groups I've mentioned. In the non-sperm fraction, the partial DNA profile obtained matches 17A or Eric Boyd. Several locations were inconclusive due to insufficient or degraded DNA. And the probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with the same DNA profile is approximately 1 in 629 million for the African American population, 1 in 3 billion for the Caucasian population, and 1 in 16 billion for the Southwestern Hispanic population. And from a shoe insole that was also included as part of that exhibit, uh, the presumptive test did not indicate the presence of semen, and presumptive test did not indicate the presence of blood. And, and there's other results in there. We'll just leave those as they are. Okay. Exhibit 311, is that a copy of that report? Yes. Right. We move that in as the next exhibit. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, your lunch is here. It is the lunch hour, so please go to the court officer. We'll start at about one o'clock. <coughs> Lunch recess till one o'clock.